Welcome, everyone. This is a day that, in my mind, is probably one of the most important celebrated days that we should be celebrating. So if you would all bow your head in prayer with me for this day. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us true liberty in your son. This liberty and this freedom works its way out into every area of life, including our civil government. So we pray for those in our federal government, our state governments, our municipal governments, <clears throat> that they would apply your word and work according to your ways and your principles. And I pray also that every one of us here would do something to make this nation a better place to live. So come and uh, speak to us, through us at this meeting, to honor you and all those who have fallen for the state of our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out to the 248th, and thank you, Mark, for the opening prayer. Uh, before we begin, I want to give a little bit of history on our nation's flag and what each of the colors represent. On April 19th of 1775, the Revolutionary War officially kicked off at the battles of Lexington and Concord. The colonies then needed a flag that would represent them they had some regional flags, but they did not have a flag that represented them as a union. The flag that they came up with was the Grand Union flag, the flag here on my right. It consisted of 13 stripes, alternating red and white, one for each of the 13 colonies, and also the Union Jack as a sign of unity among them. The Grand Union flag is America's first flag. It was used from 1775 until 1777 and was even flown by George Washington's Continental Army on campaigns and at garrisons and even on American naval ships and it was also used to represent Congress. On June 14, 1777, Congress stated that the flag of the United States should be made of 13 stripes alternating red and white and that the canton, the small blue square at the top, B, 13 white stars and a field of blue, representing a new constellation. Since 1775, there have been 28 different flags, but the colors have always been the same and meant the same thing. Red represents hardiness, valor, courage, and bravery. White represents purity and innocence. Blue represents vigilance, perseverance, and justice. song was uh, called Welcome Here Again, and it was not a song of welcome to a friend. It was written by someone, a soldier, citizen, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, welcoming the British up for more waves of attack. So it was welcoming the British to, a, to their certain fate. So I'll, I'd like to quickly just introduce uh, the musicians. Uh, most of you probably know Ron Rayfield. He's a mover and shaker here in town as it, as it applies to historical things. Um, I have the pleasure of playing one of the drums that he totally refurbished from an old Ludwig drum set. So he's a, he's a craftsman as well. And he's been in the militia for about 10 years. So uh, thanks, Ron, for all that you do here. Thank you. Uh, this is Peter Bringy. He is accompanied here by his wife and six children in the back there. Uh, he has played with the St. Charles Fife and Drum Corps and for uh, 20 years, been an instructor for 10 years, and he's an awesome fife player to say the least. So this is my daughter, Melanie. Uh, she has made all the clothing for the people that look just like us. My wife is there and uh, for all the, all the rest of the siblings. Um, I have the privilege of saying I taught her how to sew. <laughs> One straight line 
down a fabric, period, and she took off from there. I could never have made this. So we had marched in many colonial streets in Massachusetts. We played at Bunker Hill. As a matter of fact, um, Peter and I have played at Boston Commons years and years ago. So we've enjoyed doing this very much. And I'm Mark Thomas. And uh, basically ditto to everything I said about Melanie. <laughs> so we, we love American history. And uh, this is why we're doing it here, to, to help remember what went on in the past. So this next song is called Minstrel Boy. It's an ancient song. No one really knows who wrote it. It was played in the War for Independence. It was played in the Civil War. And it's actually a theme song that was the background theme song to Black Hawk Down. So this is Minstrel Boy. guys would allow me, I have some more fun facts for you about this 4th of July. On June 19, 1776, Congress selected a five-man committee to draft a formal document justifying the break with Great Britain and declaring our independence. This committee included of Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, and John Adams. On July the 2nd, Congress voted to declare the independence after more than 80 changes have been made and multiple drafts have been written. On July 3rd, John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail Adams, who they shared everything with each other. He says, on the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable moment in history of America. I believe that it will be celebrated by seeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other end for this time forward and forevermore. And boy, was he right, because here we are 248 years later, we are still doing that. On July 4th, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted by Congress. However, it was not until July 8th that it was read to the public. And then on August 2nd, John Hancock, the first signer of the Declaration of Independence, finally signed the Declaration, and the last signer of the Declaration was not until December of 1776, totaling 56 signers. I'd now like to ask Bryant and Wolfen to come up and read the Declaration of Independence for us. Good afternoon. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind, which requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their power, just powers, from the consent of the governed, and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form. 
as to them, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for their light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to the right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses, usurpations, pursuing the invariably the same object, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for the, their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to the candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of larger districts of the people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, at right inestimable, inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with uh, mainly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers and capable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all dangers of invasion from within, without, and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judici judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their office and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out of their substances. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior of the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction, jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, given his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops amongst, amongst us, for protecting them by mock, a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they have committed on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, for the benefits of trial by jury. For transporting us beyond seas to be tried for, pretend, uh, for pretended offenses. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province. Establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so that it to, as it to render it once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters abolishing our most valuable laws and altering the fundamentally altering fundamentally the forms of our governments for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with the power of legis to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us he has plundered our seas ravaged our coast burnt our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. 
He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to co complete the works of death. Desolation and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and per per perfidy scarcely paralleled in most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by his hands. He has ex excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers. The merciless Indian savages, who's known for a rule of warfare, is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been unanswered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in the intentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, excuse me, which, have would, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to us, to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind enemies in war and in peace friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are in the right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as a free and independent states, that they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you. And up next, I would like to uh, introduce my daughter, Lennox Wolfen, to come up to lead us in the pledge. So if you may all stand, remove your hats, and place your hand over your heart. Detail, hands up, present, boom. A pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order. Oh. We are now going to have the St. Jim Militia fire a volley. Police! Give me to a droit! A côté! Thank you, Captain Bill McKnight. I'd now like to ask Mark, Melanie, Peter to come up and play our nation's first national anthem, Chester. Chester was very popular with the with the uh, Continental soldiers, and it was written by William Billings in 1770. And um, 
William Billings was from Boston. He was blind in one eye, loved his schnapps, and the, the town of Boston actually gave him a job catching stray pigs, kind of an early endowment for the arts. So, uh, but nevertheless, he wrote it for church. It was, it was a hymn, and it was adapted uh, by, the war, by the Revolutionary War Continental Army and played ever since. And many, many orchestras and different bands have adapted it to, uh, uh, for their playing. So this is, this is the Revolutionary War um, adaptation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for that. We'd now like to ask the lovely Anna Ripplinger to come up and sing our modern national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, please. <laughs> stripes and bright stars through all the perilous fight or the rabbits we watch were so gallantly streaming on the rocket's right the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Woo! The next two songs we're going to play are popular colonial tunes of the time, uh, Bluebells of Scotland and The Moon and Seven Stars.
director of this site, Jeff Jiggler Ronald, to come up and give a closing speech. Thank you all for being here. There we go. Okay. Thank you all for being here. We hope you've been enjoying this. For our conclusion, I have a part of a speech that I am going to read that was written and delivered by Sam Adams on August 1st of 1776. It's important to remember that freedom and independence is not an event. It is not a single happening or a piece of paper. It is a process. And it is a process that we all are part of. And that was something that Mr. Adams wanted to remind his fellow congressional delegates on the day before they actually started signing the declaration. Other nations have received their laws from conquerors. Some are indebted for a constitution to the sufferings of their ancestors through evolving centuries. The people of this country alone have formally and deliberately chosen a government for themselves and with open and uninfluenced consent bound themselves into a social compact. Here, no man proclaims his birth or wealth as a title to honorable distinction or to sanctify ignorance and vice with the name of hereditary authority. He who has most zeal and ability to promote public felicity, let him be the servant of the public. This is the only line of distinction drawn by nature. Some who would persuade us that they have tender feelings for future generations, while they are insensible to the happiness of the present, are perpetually foreboding a train of dissensions under our popular system. Such men's reasoning amounts to this. Give up all that is valuable to Great Britain, and then you will have no inducements to quarrel among yourselves or suffer yourselves to be chained down by your enemies that you may not be able to fight with your friends. We shall neither be exposed to the necessary convulsion of elective monarchies, nor the want of wisdom, fortitude, and virtue to which hereditary succession is liable. In your hands, it will be to perpetuate a prudent, active and just legislature and which will never expire until you yourselves lose the virtues which give it existence. And brethren and fellow countrymen, if it was ever granted to mortals to trace the designs of providence and interpret its manifestations in favor of their cause, we may with humility of soul cry out, not unto us, not unto us, but to thy name be the praise. The confusion of the devices among our enemies 
and the rage of the elements against them have done almost as much towards our success as either our councils or our arms. Thus, by the beneficence of providence, we shall behold our empire arising, founded on justice and the voluntary consent of the people, and giving full scope to the exercise of those faculties and rights which most ennoble our species. Besides the advantages of liberty and the most equal constitution, heaven has given us a country with every variety of climate and soil, pouring forth in abundance whatever is necessary for the support, comfort, and strength of a nation. Within our own borders, we possess all the means of sustenance, defense, and commerce. At the same time, these advantages are so distributed among the different states of this continent, as if nature had in view to proclaim to us, be united among yourselves, and you will not want nothing from the rest of the world. We have now no other alternative than independence or the most ignominious and galling servitude. The legions of our enemies thicken our plains. Desolation and death mark their bloody career. Whilst the mangled corpses of our countrymen seem to cry out to us as a voice from heaven, will you permit our posterity to groan under the galling chains of our murderers? Has our blood been expended in vain? is the only reward which our constancy till death has obtained for our country that it should sink deep to a deeper and more ignominious vassalage. Rele recollect who are the men that demand your submission, to whose degrees you are invited to pay obedience. Men who, unmindful of their relation to you as brethren, of your long implicit submission to their laws, of the sacrifice which you and your forefathers made of your natural advantages for commerce to their avarice, formed a deliberate plan to wrest from you the small pittance of property which they had permitted you to acquire. Remember that the men who wish to rule over you are they who in pursuit of this plan of despotism annulled the sacred contracts which had been made with your ancestors, conveyed into your cities a mercenary soldiery to compel you to submission by insult and murder, who called your patience cowardice, your piety hypocrisy. These are the men to whom we are exhorted to sacrifice the blessings which providence holds out to us. The happiness, the dignity of uncontrolled freedom and independence. But instead, our union is now complete. Our constitution composed, established, and approved. You are now the guardians of your own liberties. We may justly address you as the Decemviri did the Romans and say, nothing that we propose can pass into law without your consent. Be yourselves, O Americans, the authors of those laws on which your happiness depends. You have now in the field armies sufficient to repel the whole force of your enemies and their base and mercenary auxiliaries. The hearts of your soldiers beat high with the spirit of freedom. They are animated with the justice of their cause, and while they grasp their swords, can look up to heaven for assistance. Your adversaries are composed of wretches who laugh at the rights of humanity, who turn religion into derision, and would, for higher wages, direct their swords against their own leaders or their own country. Go on, then, in your generous enterprise, with gratitude to heaven for past success and confidence of it in the future. For my own part, I ask no greater blessing than to share with you the common danger and common glory. If I have a wish dearer to my soul than that my ashes may be mingled with those of a Warren and Montgomery, it is that these American states, 
may never cease to be free and independent. I would now like to ask for Justine Rayfield. Justine is going to cut and serve the cake. My friends and fellow Americans, I look out in the crowd and I'm so honored that all of you came today to help us to preserve our tradition, our customs, and our culture as Americans. Even though we hold the patriotism in our hearts every day, the event today is coming to a close. But, you know, in the 18th century, it was a custom which has now died out to serve what was called Independence Cake on the 4th of July. So we have gotten for you all cake. If you would like it, of course it's free. Just come up and help yourself. And we also have cold water in the cooler. If you'd like, stick around for as long as you want. Make new friends. We're all Americans here. Thank you so much for coming to the event today. And we hope to see you again next year. And God bless. <laughs> Right down the middle of the best. <laughs> <laughs>